If you make something overly abundant, it becomes worthless. This is the fastest level of adoption of any technology in all recorded history. So the internet grew in from 1990 to 2000 at 63% a year. In 1997, there was 150 million users of the internet. Currently, there's 150 million users of crypto and the network is growing at 113% a year. So it's twice the speed of the internet. So what does that mean? This is the network of money, the network of value. Now, if you understand network businesses, you'll understand Facebook. So here's a giant network, three and a half billion, where we got to use the network to connect with people, unless it was yesterday when the internet didn't work, when, when it all went down. But let's assume that it did work. You get to get the psychological benefit of likes and connecting with people, and they get to monetize you. So the value of the network accrues to the company and the shareholders. So the shareholders got rich and our brains just rotted. You know, that was the trade-off. <laughs> but when you're talking about cryptocurrencies, it changes that network model to something where the network participants are also the owners of the network. So the network, let's say at the simplest level is Bitcoin and Everybody who uses the Bitcoin network has to use Bitcoin, has to own Bitcoin. And so the more people that come on the network, the more the value of the network goes up. It's called Metcalfe's Law. It's the value, the number of connections, plus the interconnectedness between all of the people on the network. So crypto supercharges this, which is why it's growing so fast. It's kind of built in human behavioral virality within it. So what does that mean and why should people care? Well, we've already said it's the fastest adoption of any technology in all recorded history. If you'd have known about the internet in 1997 and had made the right bets, which was harder back then because it was multiple companies and not one, not the underlying protocols. Here we get to bet on the protocol. It's going to be the largest distribution or redistribution of wealth in all history. So why do I say that? Well, we can just extrapolate the numbers. As networks grow, the rate of growth comes down a bit. So it's currently growing 113% a year. If it drops to 83% a year, then we get to a billion users from the 150 today by 2024. We get to three and a half to four billion users by assuming the trend rate of growth then drops after five years to let's say 63%, which is the internet grew at. We get to four billion users by the end of the decade. So if this is a network of money, therefore the value of this network is going to utterly explode. So how do I put that in context? In context, it means that it's currently a $2 trillion market. Sounds big, right? But all the other asset classes, like equities and bonds and real estate, they're all 200 to 300 trillion. So if this is going to grow at the speed we think and get the adoption that it looks like it's getting, and that's provable maths, then the probability is, is that this gets to be worth 200 trillion at least. So, so you think that Bitcoin, Ethereum, these have the opportunity or ability to 100x in the near future? The entire space, not just one coin, everything you touch, basically. Now, there's going to be winners and losers. So that's the financial incentive of why this matters. But it matters at a much deeper level, which is this is a redistribution of power within the financial world, where the individual doesn't need the middleman. So this is the transfer and storage, trusted storage of all digital assets and eventually all assets go onto a blockchain. So this is the start of new business models and everybody watching this will have seen the rise of NFTs, which is a nascent start in what's going on here. We'll see the rise of social tokens. All of these things are blockchain enabled. We're already seeing finance itself be decentralized, decentralized finance, where there's no bank. It's an algorithm and it's based around these blockchain protocols. And the smart contracts allow these protocols to be programmed. So that means you can put a set of rules in it. So it's going to give us the power not only 
to invest and make money. And these things, Bitcoin may be 50,000 today, but it, it breaks down to eight decimal places. So anybody can put 10% of their net worth in, however poor they are. So for dollar cost averaging and wealth building, this is extraordinary. But it also creates the technology for this new kind of power shift where we've given up trusting the banks. We've given up trusting who were supposed to be the fiduciaries and we can take control back ourselves. Even identity will go on the blockchain. So we can share it with Facebook and Google on the terms that we accept. So this is a technological and a financial and a cultural revolution all at the same time. So it's interesting that you brought up people are losing trust with banks, especially after we saw happen in 2020 and 2021, where the Federal Reserve Bank printed trillions and trillions of dollars to stimulate the economy. I mean, I think that's another argument for why people are moving towards cryptocurrency. But what happens to institutions like the Federal Reserve Bank if people start to adopt cryptocurrency more? Because I have a feeling, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that they're not going to like it. Correct. So what the Federal Reserve are doing is they're looking at the macro backdrop, which is the most indebted global economy in all of history, 400% of GDP in debt, of which the US is by far the largest. Um, so you've got this situation where the world is in debt, the population is aging, you can't generate growth, and jobs are being competed for by robots, AI, globalization. So you've got this structurally very difficult world. How do you service the debt? And the answer has been to print more money. Now, printing money lowers the value of fiat currency, all the central banks doing at the same time. So it's not just the dollar or the yen, it's all of them. So that whole printing of money means if you make something overly abundant, it becomes worthless. Now, it's not saying fiat currency is worthless yet, but basically the central banks are increasing their balance sheet by about 13% a year since 2008. That means we're all getting poorer because wages don't go up, but assets do. And assets are future savings, a future expenditure. So you stick it into, a, let's say, a second property as an investment, and then you'll sell it in due course because you want to realize the money to be able to spend. That's all assets are, they're deferred consumption. But it means that we can buy less of those because they keep going up. They're going up because the value of the dollar is dropping, the denominator, not because the price is rising in, in, the, in terms driven necessarily entirely by demand. So we're all getting poor and this helps that. The central banks don't want it because they don't want the debt bubble to burst. So they want you to keep in the system, devalue your savings, devalue your working salaries to try and keep this system alive to protect the baby boomers who've basically got most of the debt and most of the issue. 